This is Fresh Tracks Weekly. So last week, we were out in eastern Montana, and we put a lot of miles on both the uh, pickup and the ATV. We were trying to catch lake trout. Uh, we fished our butts off, and we covered a ton of ground, and we just didn't have a lot of luck. Uh, we saw a few fish on our finders. On, you could see them on the graph. We could get them to chase our hooks. Um, we were fishing in like 60 feet of water. They chase our hooks up, sometimes all the way to the hole. They just wouldn't bite. Okay, he's gone. Well, that's about how she goes here. I guess you you win some, you lose some. It was, it was pretty brutal to spend that amount of time and effort and uh, not have one on a, on a rod and reel. But we did get one on a tip-up. One lone small lake trout on a tip-up. <laughs> so, not skunked. It was my first lake trout ever, so I had to cook it up. I wanted to get the full, the full taste of what a lake trout is, and uh, it was pretty good. Yeah, I uh, just did simple grill, salt, pepper, just like any other trout. I feel like there's just more variation between uh, trout in one system to the other, just what the color of the flesh is. The darker, the pinker, the oranger the flesh, uh, the better it is. And this one was kind of in the middle, so yeah, good stuff. But anyway, Randy's out of the office again this week. He's uh, out in Oregon at another sportsman show. Didn't realize how many sportsman shows there actually are kind of in that Pacific Northwest. Uh, there's a little circuit and he's been out there, you know, shaking babies, kissing hands, doing his thing. So unfortunately, he's out of the office this week. Um, but while he's gone, Jace's uh, turn to cook up an office meal. He cooked up these uh, antelope sliders of sorts, which we just ate. It was like a simple, delicious meal. Big fan, antelope sliders, antelope from Montana. Yeah, very good. On YouTube, we released that deer biology video and uh, we have been experimenting with some other stuff. We're making some short videos, the YouTube shorts of wild game cooking. Um, so that's going up. And then next week you will be able to check out the Anything Goes, that's all things walleye culture. Um, this was a fun one, check it out. Uh, Randy in his full walleye mode, exploring that out on Fort Peck. Um, yeah, and, and also in terms of fisheries, I just got my data back from uh, my Montana paddlefish, which is like, this is my trophy hat basically. They give it to you if you submit your data, if you submit a harvested paddlefish jawbone sample, you get this hat, uh, which is pretty sweet, big fan of it. But anyway, I got my data back and my fish was 37 years old. Um, it was 75 pounds, 37 years old. Rocky got his back, his fish was 90 pounds, and his fish was 40 years old. Pretty crazy, long-lived species. Uh, these fish are older than me by a ways. Pretty crazy. Just dinosaurs out there in the middle of Montana. Over on the subscription platform, we have a trail cam video that is up now, and then next week you'll be able to check out Randy's lessons learned on his special tags he drew in Montana. He drew a mountain goat and a Shire's moose tag in the same year, Good stuff going up there on Hunt Talk Radio. Both part one and part two of the corner crossing discussion is up. Definitely give it a listen. It's extremely intriguing if you're at all uh, familiar with the uh, land access issue in the west of all this checkerboard land. Uh, they dive super deep into it, talk about the history, talk about uh, the potential future. Good stuff. They're actually so much interest in this we're going to put those podcasts on youtube they're up you can check them out now uh, randy did a little video intro to kind of explain what was going on last week we shot this episode out on the ice we were running out of light i was rushing through everything i'll, I'll try to slow it down a little bit a little bit today as we jump into our headlines in new mexico stream access law has been in a back and forth battle for years um, if you're unfamiliar stream access in the united states is primarily decided state to state um, so what you can do in a given waterway depends on the state you're in and the point of contention often arises when the streams or rivers flow through private land and the landowner wants to have exclusive access to that waterway. So the laws in each state vary from having no access at all to those waters or having pretty much any access you want, whether you can float, you can walk, as long as you're staying below the high water mark. So there's a lot of different distinctions between what's considered navigable and non-navigable and what you can do in a navigable or non-navigable stream. Again, state to state, it's very complicated, um, but 
in New Mexico. The public has long had access to float and fish its rivers, as long as they didn't trespass to reach a stream or to leave the stream. It began to be questioned in 2014. And by 2017, the rules began to change. The State Game Commission began to approve petitions to private landowners who wanted to close sections of rivers that they deemed non-navigable. Again, this is a subjective definition. On March 1st, the New Mexico Supreme Court ruled that those regulations were unconstitutional. So these landowners who had previously blocked access to these stretches can no longer restrict access. Uh, so most of the public waterway users are obviously super excited about this. They're chalking it up as a win. Um, and I'm sure this is going to continue to be a battle in the state in the future. Um, it's been a battle in Montana. I'm sure other states. Uh, it's anytime that there's a landowner who wants to have exclusive access to a stream and there's a public who wants to use that stream, this is going to be a contentious issue. So update on Sunday hunting that we've been talking about. Virginia passed a bill that will allow hunting on public lands. So definitely a big win for the public land hunters of Virginia. Uh, we'll keep you updated on how the other states progress. In Colorado, they're trying to get more highway wildlife crossings. Uh, they're trying to get more funding for the state. The legislature introduced SB 151, which al would allocate $25 million out of the general fund into a fund dedicated to these wildlife safe passages. With that money, they would be able to leverage a lot more money in federal grants to go towards these wildlife crossing projects. There are nearly 4,000 wildlife vehicle collisions every year, and the state estimates that this costs around $80 million between property damage, emergency response, and medical treatment. This fund would be used to pay for various wildlife crossing projects that, are, that the Department of Transportation has previously identified and prioritized. Initially, this bill appears to have a lot of support from sportsmen. I imagine most of the opposition is gonna come in the form of concerns over the allocation of that 25 million out of the general fund. A little update on the wolf relisting situation. Randy and I previously had that discussion about wolves being relisted and how that court decision didn't affect the state's management in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. Uh, Bart from Washington emailed me to point out that there's also portions in Oregon and Washington where the state still maintains control over the management over wolves um, because they're considered recovered in those areas. So a little correction there. Um, but in that same realm, there's been movement in the Great Lakes population, which were put back on the endangered species list. There are several U.S. senators from Wisconsin, as, as well as several senators from Wyoming that introduced legislation that would allow the management to return to the states and delist wolves once again in, in the Great Lakes region and Wyoming. If I'm reading this correctly, they aren't trying to delist as a whole, but rather just in those regions. So this legislative tactic, in theory, would block future court decisions and court reversals by prohibiting judicial review. Um, this is a little confusing because like I just stated, Wyoming wasn't included in that relisting, but it appears to be a preemptive measure on Wyoming's part for their involvement because there are groups that are currently petitioning the, wildlife the Fish Wildlife Service to relist in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. So it'll be interesting to see if this gains any, any traction. Uh, I'm sure like anything wolf related, it's gonna have very extreme opinions on both sides. In Vermont, there are three bills moving forward that could affect hunting and trapping in the state. Uh, all three were scheduled to be heard this week. Um, I was trying to figure out the legislative website in Vermont and uh, to be able to watch these hearings and, and I couldn't find them. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to give a status on what happened next week. But here's a quick breakdown of what's currently being proposed. SB 281 would prohibit the use of dogs to hunt coyotes, which is currently allowed in Vermont. SB 201 would ban foothold tra traps in the state, which again is also currently allowed. Um, you can usually predict the likely culprits in these. Of course, you have the hunters and trappers on one side who have traditionally hunted using these methods for years. And then on the other side, you have animal rights groups who argue that these methods are inhumane. Also in Vermont, SB 129 would change the authority of the Fish and Wildlife Board and also change how people are appointed to that board. Uh, honestly, it's hard for me to wrap my head around this. On the surface, it appears this bill is attempting to take decision-making power away from the people who have knowledge on hunting. Generally, I feel like we as sportsmen like to advocate for those who are trained in the field of biology, that are familiar with hunting, fishing, trapping. We want those people to be the ones making decisions. The thing is, from state to state and how these game commissions work and how the legislature works, it's hard to know what people's agendas are, where they're coming from, and what their level of expertise in the field is. The moral of the story is, if you live in Vermont, I would dig into this further and figure out what's going on. It's hard for me to know, uh, not being involved with that process, but there's definitely stuff moving, and I'm sure there's parts of the story that I'm not seeing. 
And Wyoming, I keep bringing it up, Senate File 61. The sage grouse farming bill continues to progress and it looks like it's probably gonna get pushed through. Uh, the Wyoming's legislature seems pretty dead set on, on pushing this through. Interestingly, both sides on this are advocating for it and want the same thing. They both want sage grouse to thrive in Wyoming. They want to keep them off the endangered species list. It's just the argument of how we do that. It's, it's interesting to watch as people make decisions on these topics that are pretty uneducated in, in that realm. Um, yeah, I think I wanna use this as a segue for a deeper dive where we just talk about the weird world of legislation and how very often people making the decisions on these are not subject experts. They don't actually know uh, much about the topics that, that, they're, that they're voting on. So we're gonna get our production coordinator, Paul Kemper in here to fill in for Randy. Randy's out of the office, so Paul's gonna fill in. He has a lot more experience in the world of legislation than me, so here we go. We have substitute Randy with us this week because Randy's in Oregon. And so Paul Kemper is yep. filling in. Store brand Randy. Paul's got a lot of experience with uh, <laughs> the world of whatever, legislature, going to fish and game commission meetings, way more than I do. So I don't that's know much I, experience, a lot of just getting yelled at. Yeah, but that's <laughs> but more than I've done. So uh, I feel like you're a, you're a good resource for this conversation. But the thing is, uh, sage grouse. Diving deeper into the sale of sage grouse uh, debate in Wyoming currently. Um, I don't know why I care so much about sage grouse. They're just really cool. I worked with them in the past. Did, I was a field technician. They're, They're just, just like that, that western species, you know, like such a, a representative of the things that we love. So They're kind of, the it's hard not kind of a to, canary in the coal mine yeah, type it's of hard situation not to love too. Them. So. But anyway, I'm going to lay a little groundwork, kind of go into how we got to where we are. Um, in the last hundred years, sage grouse declined a ton. Like they just went way down and uh, everyone's worried that they could end up on the endangered species list. That's one of the main reasons that this is so front and center, why people are so concerned about it. Uh, and I feel like pretty much, all, and I wouldn't say all stakeholders, but most stakeholders don't want them on the endangered species list. Hunters don't want that to happen. Oil and gas developers don't want that to happen. Ranchers don't want it. Farmers, nobody wants that. With the exception of a few people maybe, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never say never, but um, I think it's good for everyone to not have sage grouse on the ESA. Yeah, so a lot of I guess a lot of the local stakeholders on the ground in Wyoming don't want them on the list. Um, and yeah, I mean even the staunchest of oil and gas developers, like that's going to just make their business more complicated. So everyone's kind of arguing for the same thing. And uh, the whole this whole Senate File sixty one started a few years ago, or I mean this is like a progression of a bill a few years ago that allowed a private company to experiment with sage grouse farming. So basically breeding or collecting wild sage grouse eggs, taking them into a facility, hatching them, captive breeding programs, trying to produce more sage grouse. Mm -hmm. And on the surface, it seems like, I, I mean, I, I totally understand the motive. It seems like, well, there's not enough sage grouse. Let's just make more sage grouse. But it's a lot more complicated than that. It just yeah. Yeah, it, it's, not, uh, it's not that simple. Biology rarely is. Yeah, sage grouse are a notoriously vulnerable species. They just don't do well in the face of change. Um, they need intact sagebrush landscapes to succeed. They, we just know this. A lot of money and effort research has gone into this in the last, like, probably 20 years or more, but it's just a lot of effort's gone into this because everyone saw the writing on the wall. And the major thing is like, the more factors that you add into the equation, the further you get away from an intact sagebrush landscape, the worse they do. So if you put more fences in, you put more roads in, you put more oil and gas developments in, you get more invasive species coming into the landscape. Mm -hmm. And the major thing is, if you get rid of sagebrush, you don't have sage grouse. You don't have sage grouse. So the reason I'm like framing all this is because I, I don't think everyone understands this. A lot of people, I even heard it in this, uh, the last hearing on SF61, they were mentioning ringneck pheasants. And the thing is, pheasants and sharp-tailed grouse, in the face of change, have done a lot better. They have adapted to agriculture. You put a bunch of wheat fields in, and it actually does, they do better in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think people realize that sage grouse and sharp-tailed grouse aren't the same thing. They're very different, and I bet most people can't tell the difference between, if they saw both of them sitting on the ground, they probably wouldn't know which one's which. Yeah. And that's I, kind of the fundamental, that's like kind of the basis of. Well, I mean, you can look at it like white tails and mule deer, you yeah. know, 
whitetails are just kicking the butt of mule deer across the landscape as far as adaptability. Yeah. You know, they're like the cockroach. You know, mm -hmm. they can live anywhere, survive anything. I've seen whitetails at 7,000 feet. Yep. Like, what are you doing here? They're just able to adapt to change but really well. But, you know, so like a development goes in or something happens to mule deer migration corridors and it's like, okay, we need to take a look at this and yeah. see how we can prevent it. They're so much more susceptible. Yeah. And it's similar to pheasants and sharp tails where I've seen them, you know, in the junipers, like bunches of birds, like, what are you doing here? Like, oh, okay, you're, you're here. Yeah. You know, and I've seen pheasants in places where, you know, you can kill a pheasant in Georgia. You can kill a pheasant in Louisiana. You can kill a pheasant in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. You can kill them anywhere. They are adaptable. Yeah. But the sage grouse are very... No, and that's why there's kind of that canary the in the coal mine. Because when you start changing the landscape, they're one of the first things that starts... I guess one of the first game species, anyway, mm -hmm. that people are that see. They're the first thing to go down. And I, I don't know. Maybe more people know this than I think, but it's, it's, a, it's definitely an inconvenient thing to hear. To this, like, that... No, we need large, intact sagebrush landscapes in order for these birds to be successful. It's like, ooh, yeah, well, that doesn't really work with my yeah, agenda. Yeah, yeah, but, but so I don't know. I don't know how much of it's like ignoring the truth, or just not. I think there's both. I think that some people just don't understand how different they are, and then there's also a little bit of like kind of looking the other way from what the root of the real problem is. I feel like so much of the debate watching this Wyoming thing go down is like, can the captive breeding program be successful in like raising a chick to whatever, a few months old, and then releasing into the wild? To me, that's completely irrelevant. Because sure. you're, you're putting a thing out in a landscape that's not going to survive it. Like, mm -hmm. you're putting a fish in a dry fish tank. It's just like, it's not going to, it's not going to make it. But anyway. So, well, we've had that similar discussion in Montana. You know, it's it's funny because you've got people that like you said n most of the stakeholders are on the same page. Yeah. Like they want the same thing. Yep. And instead of being like, okay, this is what we want. Let's figure out a way that makes sense for a sustainable long-term action plan that mm -hmm. allows this goal to be accomplished properly seems like there's a lot of people yelling like I want this and then somebody was like I want this too and it's like instead of trying to come to a, a conclusion that makes sense yeah for everyone they're just trying to get to the goal as quick as possible which is arguably short-sighted when you you know in comparison to you know Montana now we're releasing a million dollars worth of pen raised birds but the idea of more pheasants on the landscape mm -hmm. at face value sounds really nice. Yeah. But the fact that, you know, study after study after study after study shows that coyotes and owls and, you know, red-tailed hawks. Basically, none of them are going to make it to your two. Just get crushed, don't survive. Yeah. So it's just like the cycle of having to put more and more and more and more and more instead of like imagine a million dollars of pheasant habitat projects right and how many birds could carry over you yeah. know i think a lot of like the larger the bigger picture is missed for some of these like very niche conversations mm -hmm. where everyone wants the same thing but yeah i think that a lot of times they're looking at numbers like well yeah. more is better we need it's, more yeah it's spreadsheets it's nothing else though so. and so it's just like the failure to look at the root of the problem in a lot of cases. And I, I try to put myself in like the shoes of like an oil and gas person or put myself in the shoes of a rancher, farmer, whatever. From that perspective, I feel like they, I mean, they know that they, they don't want these birds on the endangered species list. That's like, that's going to make business harder. It's going to complicate everything. So they want more birds on the landscape. And I think that's, that's why we're, where, where we're at with this. But even from that perspective, I feel like li if you listen to the biologists and you listen to everyone who's telling, <laughs> telling you the writing on the wall, this isn't the path forward. And it's just like, I, I don't understand. I think they're shooting themselves in the foot, honestly, because long term, it's not sustainable. Like all, all the data sh is pointing towards this is not the path forward. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it's a distraction and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be worse for everyone in the long run going down these rabbit holes than it would be if we just like 
compromised in other re re like realms. Like, okay, well, we're going to preserve this chunk of landscape. Yeah, this is going to get sacrificed, but this chunk, that's preserved for sage grouse or whatever it is. But mm -hmm. it's just like, I feel like we go constantly go down these rabbit holes that are distractions that are just causing more issues that it's just going the other direction. And that's, I kind of wanted to use this as a segue into, and you've attended a lot more public meetings, gone to commission meetings, gone to the legislature mm -hmm. and watch this. And one, and I've, I'm just starting to dip my toes into it. The thing I realized is that it's not necessarily, like people are rarely malicious in their actions. A lot of times they're just uneducated. I guess they are like in the realms of decisions that they have to, or in the, you know, especially with wildlife. They just don't know the intricacies of wildlife management, but we can't expect them to know all of the intricacies of wildlife management. Yeah. And you could maybe even wonder like, well, why are these people the ones making decisions? But that's the field that we play on. That's, that's the way it is. But I don't know, like how, what have you noticed in going to these? I mean, do you, do you feel that way that it's like oftentimes they're voting on something that they know very little about? Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, in the process, different people get put on certain committees kind of based on their background or where they live that mm -hmm. tries to get them to a place where, you know, they're making quasi informed decisions right. or when they hear from the public that they can understand that fully. You know, last year or in 2021, I heard uh, someone at the legislature ask what hunters do with the grizzly bear meat in Montana. Right. And it's like, we don't hunt them here. Yeah. You know, <laughs> maybe like... that shouldn't, you know, th we need to make sure that that's very clear too, you know, like, and so we wish, you know, for us, it's what we're passionate about. We are always reading stuff. We're always looking stuff up, right. learning more. And, you know, whether it's hunting or public lands or whatever it is, that's kind of where we live. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these people are, you know, they're running cattle, you know, 365, 24 seven, and that's their world, except for this chunk of time that they're mm -hmm. in Helena and they were elected by their you know local population to represent their interests and mm -hmm. so like for us it's very easy to be like you need to listen to us and or you should know more about this but they can't possibly know more about every single thing and a lot of it comes down to just us the hunter or the farmer or the rancher or whomever to say hey here's this issue here's the facts yeah and here's you know, here's, you know, what I would propose to be the best path forward. Here are some things you should know, because you can't expect them to know everything. Right. And the big thing is like, they're human beings, they're people, mm -hmm. right? And it's, I remember the first time I went to Helena and spoke and like my heart was in my throat and yeah. I was like sweating profusely and it was just, I was so nervous. Then I got up there and I said my piece and I like kind of stumbled a little bit, but got my words out. And then afterwards I spoke with them and they're Montanans too, right. right? Like they're human beings and like they're not there to try and light the place on fire. Well, and they're most, a lot of the times this is volunteer, these are volunteer positions. Yeah, I mean, they like, get like a stipend or whatever. Or the, and or the legislature, like they're, they're not like, it's not their job. It's not I their main job. I wouldn't want to invite but, the vitriol that they receive at times, you know, taking that position. Like it's not easy work. Yeah. And they're there to try and do the best they can. And so I think so much of it is just like this perspective and a lot of it is we're all wanting the same thing. We, we're kind of trying to achieve the same goal. We may have different opinions on how to get there. Yeah. But I think, you know, if all parties involved recognize it, like, all right, here's the problem. We're now going to comment on how we approach this and then work towards that goal and keep that in mind. It's like, it's so valuable. The number of conversations I've had, you know, in Helena with folks that I like, vehemently disagree with. Mm -hmm but had a conversation with, it's like, all right, we can start to get oh, yeah. somewhere, you know? And it's, it's so easy on the internet to just spew. Right. And like say terrible things and yeah. lose track of like, eh, let's get back to talking about how we get there and educating people and not, you know, coming off as a jerk, not belittling the fact that they don't know. Yeah. It's like, listen, I mean, that's why you go to school. It's why you do different things. Like people have what they're interested in. You all come together and, Try to figure it out. I don't know. I'm just still trying to learn so much about this, but with the whole Wyoming, just watching some of those hearings is just, I don't know. It's like hard for me to get, grasp it, like what the, 
the motives are. And I think, I think a lot of it comes down to just not, whether it's an unwillingness to look at the facts, which I think there's some of that, but I think a lot of it's just not knowing. And that's where, like what you're saying, it comes up to the public, biologists, whoever, to speak their minds and share. And uh, maybe they still won't listen. Part of that is kind of like your basic human nature. Mm -hmm. You know, is to find like the quickest, easiest, most efficient way to the answer. Right. You know, to the thing. And it goes across all things that people do, whether it's, you know, the process of shooting a bow or solving a problem in the legislature or trying to address an issue. Yeah. So people just want to get there. And so it's part of that may be true. It's this not looking at all the facts, but is it because people don't want to see the facts? Maybe, or maybe it's because here's an answer that's been presented. It's like a very, a very simple equation. Like, like, oh. You see a complicated equation and you see a, like a very simple equation. Like, ooh, I really like the looks of that simple equation. Yeah, you know, Even though it's like, I don't know if it's right. Well, and sometimes it's two very plus simple. two doesn't equal four in these situations either though. And so it's just like, yeah. No, I think there's some of that. I think it's just like often, yeah, the simplest path forward is the path of least resistance, it's just, let's try that. But well, it's easy to say that, hey, we did something. Yeah. It didn't work out or it did or whatever. You know, it's a right. lot easier to say, hey, we did something than to spend three years, you know, racking your brains of the right way. Yeah. And that's what Teddy Roosevelt, there's three things you can do, the right thing, the wrong thing, and then nothing. Yeah. And I don't know. But, yeah, it's just kind of, it's frustrating, but it's just kind of part of the process. Mm-hmm. No, it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out. I have a feeling that this uh, Senate File 61 is going to get pushed through. And in the scheme of things, it probably isn't, like, it probably is not going to have that big of an impact realistically. I don't think, like, pull it, because I think a, some of the big concern is privatization of wildlife. You're pulling these eggs out of nests that are wild eggs. But in the grand scheme, it's I think it's just a distraction. And mm -hmm. I think that it's not going to be necessarily bad or good for the overall thing so some of this and just getting worked up over nothing <laughs> well, but it's just like i think it's just a distraction from the real problem which yeah. is habitat loss and fragmentation and um yeah but we'll see got anything else you want to any words of wisdom to sign off with on this uh fresh tracks weekly I on your I first substitute randy uh <laughs> <laughs> my store brand randy appearance uh I would just say, yeah, I mean, just stay involved and stay aware of what's going on, mm -hmm. you know, and it's easy to get frustrated that someone might not care about something as much as you do. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, well, you should care more about this. And it's like, well, you obviously do. So do something about it. You know, you can write an email and make a phone call and yeah. do those things. And you can become that person, that advocate who's going to say something about the things you care about. Mm -hmm. So just know what's going on, stay aware of what's, what's coming down the pike, and don't be afraid to say something. And the more you do that, the more you get engaged, the better you become at it. It's a much easier to, there's still times where I have an email typed out, and I just don't hit send for like 15 minutes, and I just read it over and over again, because I'm nervous I'm going to spell something wrong and look like an <laughs> idiot. And, you know, but you get better at that. You get better at the whole process. Right. And it is, it's, a, it's just a process. So the more you participate the easier it is. Sweet. Well, thanks, thanks for, for uh, thanks for having filling me. In. Yeah. yeah, appreciate it, man. All right. Uh, if you have any uh, things you want to send us, any issues, any topics, weekly at freshtracks.tv. That's the email. Nice. Perfect.